Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and you've reached the Book of Mormon Lecture Series. I've been teaching seminary and institute for the last 11 years, and uh, this is an attempt to do a deep dive into the Book of Mormon itself. I'm hoping that you'll find this uplifting and edifying. This is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but every attempt has been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. So if you're ready for a deep dive into the Book of Mormon, here we go. Hi, and welcome back to the Book of Mormon podcast. This is going to be 3rd Nephi, chapter 29. So we're getting to the end here of Jesus' ministry among the Nephites. He has just uh, helped three Nephites become translated beings. And we read quite a bit about what it means to be a translated person. So uh, let's go ahead and read 29, verse 1. And now, behold, I say unto you, that when the Lord shall see fit in his wisdom that these sayings, meaning the Book of Mormon, shall come unto the Gentiles according to his word, then ye may know that the covenant which the Father hath made with the children of Israel concerning their restoration to the lands of their inheritance is already beginning to be fulfilled. We often teach the gospel without mentioning the covenant of Abraham or the house of Israel as though these covenants did not even exist. In the Book of Mormon, Teaches, Jesus teaches us that the ancient covenants are as valid today as they were 4,000 years ago. I believe that they have something to do with the political events occurring in the world and also with our children and grandchildren traveling to various places of the earth among war and, revela- and revolution to tell of the restoration of the gospel and of the Book of Mormon. These events are occurring before our very eyes. According to Jesus' own words, the covenants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph are still important to the Father and to Jesus and should also be important to us. And that was by Robert Matthews. Verse 2, And ye may know that the words of the Lord, which have been spoken by the holy prophets, shall all be fulfilled, and ye need not say that the Lord delays his coming unto the children of Israel. A careful review of the signs of the times demonstrates that these things are close. In Mormon doctrine, Elder McConkie lists 51 signs of the times. By interpretation, 39 of these signs have already been fulfilled, 8 of them must yet be fulfilled prior to the second coming, and 4 of them are fulfilled at his coming and not before. Furthermore, these 8 unfulfilled signs could easily be fulfilled in the matter of just a few years. You're probably wondering, what are the 8 signs yet to be fulfilled? Should I just tell you to go look them up, or should I tell you? All right, I'll tell you. Uh, One, the return of the ten tribes. Two, New Jerusalem to be built in Jackson County, Missouri. Three, the temple to be built in Jerusalem. Four, the gathering at Adam on Diamond, the great sacrament meeting that will be held there where the Savior will be crowned and become king. Verse five, the great hailstorm will destroy the crops of the earth. Six, a final great war to attend the second coming, Armageddon. Seven, special mission in Jerusalem of two Latter-day prophets. And I won't go into that. I love that story. Uh, And eight, there will be a great earthquake as never before seen. And I think that's the bringing back of the continents back together. So those are the eight that haven't yet happened. Uh, Now, continuing on. Now, learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near even at the doors. That was from Matthew 24. Wilford Woodruff said, The world may say that he delays his coming until the end of the earth, but they know neither the thoughts nor the ways of the Lord. The Lord will not delay his coming because of their unbelief, and the signs both in heaven and earth indicate that it is near. The fig trees are leafing in sight of all the nations of the earth, and if they had the Spirit of God, they could see and understand them. Henry B. Eyring said, The Lord knew we would be tempted to procrastinate the most important preparation we could ever make in this life. More than once, he warned us about delay. He taught the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom did not fill their lamps for the coming of the bridegroom. He also gave the parable of the servants who were faithless because they believed their Lord would delay his coming. The results of delay were tragic. The temptation to delay repentance comes not only at the end of the world as suggested by those scriptures. That temptation seems to have been nearly constant since the beginning of time and goes on throughout our lives. In youth, we may have thought, there will be a time enough to worry about spiritual things just before my mission or before marriage. Spiritual things are for older people. Then in the early years of marriage, the pressures of life, of jobs, of bills, of finding a moment for rest and recreation seem to crowd us so closely that delay in meeting obligations to God and family again seem re- seems reasonable. It is, it is easy to think perhaps there will be more time for that in the middle years, but the compression of time does not ease in the years that follow. There is so much to do and time seems to shrink. 
Finally, we are personally accountable because the Lord has given us ample warning. Even the acceptance of personal responsibility may not overcome the temptation to believe that now is not the time to repent. Now can seem so difficult and later appear so much easier. The truth is that today is always a better day to repent than any tomorrow. The very faith we need to repent is weakened by delay. Verse 3, And ye need not imagine in your hearts that the words which have been spoken are vain. For behold, the Lord will remember his covenant which he hath made unto his people of the house of Israel. And when ye shall see these things, meaning the Book of Mormon, coming forth among you, then ye need not any longer spurn at the doings of the Lord, for the sword of his justice is in his right hand. And behold, at that day, if ye shall spurn at his doings, he will cause that it shall soon overtake you. Woe unto him that spurneth at the doings of the Lord, yea, woe unto him that shall deny the Christ and his works. Yea, woe unto him that shall deny the revelations of the Lord, and that shall say the Lord no longer worketh by revelation, or by prophecy, or by gifts, or by tongues, or by healings, or by the power of the Holy Ghost. Yea, and woe unto him that shall say at that day to get gain, that there can be no more there can be no miracle wrought by Jesus Christ, for he for he that doeth this shall become like unto the son of perdition, for whom there, there was no mercy according to the word of Christ. Yea, and ye need not any longer hiss, nor spurn, nor make game of the Jews, nor any of the remnant of the house of Israel. For behold, the Lord remembereth his covenant unto them, and he will do unto them according to that which he hath sworn. Elder Ray Pratt said, How many are there of us who are entirely guiltless of the things that the Lord has told in this chapter? meaning chapter 29, that we should not do. How many of us are entirely guiltless of looking down upon the Jews and upon certain branches of the house of Israel? And how many of us are there that do not believe implicitly in our hearts that the Lord is going to fulfill these mighty and, as they look to us, almost impossible promises unto those people? I testify to you, my brethren and sisters, that this word is true, and this book brought forth by the instrumentality of Joseph Smith is a revelation of God unto the world. Verse 9, Therefore ye need not suppose that ye can turn the right hand of the Lord unto the left, that he may not ex execute judgment unto the fulfilling of the covenant which he hath made unto the house of Israel. Russell M. Nelson said, The heading, uh, heading to chapter 29 of Third Nephi states, The coming forth of the Book of Mormon is a sign that the Lord has commenced to gather Israel and fulfill his covenants. News media have have carried stories occasionally of incidents pertaining to the early history of the church and the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. What these news accounts fail to report is that the Book of Mormon has come forth in fulfillment of prophecy, ancient and modern, and that it was translated by the gift and power of God, then pronounced as the most nearly correct book on the face of the earth. Reporters may also fail to note that it is a sign of the covenant of God to the world that the last days are forthcoming. We will be accountable not to news reports, but to this scripture. Ye need not suppose that ye can turn the right hand of the Lord unto the left, that he may not execute judgment unto the fulfilling of the covenant which he hath made unto the house of Israel. I bear testimony that these things are true, that we are in the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that it's ongoing, and that we'll see a lot more things happening to the unfolding of the restoration. I bear that testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. See you later.